Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this video on Guide to Legal History and Historians, where we will be going through the entirety of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins. Today we will be doing the respective chapters Critical Legal Studies Europe by Emilios Christodoulis Dulidis and Johan van der Walt and Feminist Histi Historiography of Law, an Exposition and Proposition by Maria Dracopoulou. Um, my apologies for the delay on this video. Um, we just passed the halfway point. However, please do not watch these videos chronologically. However, I had a, some unfortunate luck. However, it's almost ironic because I'm reading the Book of Job in the Old Testament right now, and Job was a guy who was individual who is pure in the eyes of God, but Satan asks God to challenge him and takes away basically everything he has. And fortunately, he keeps faith and things turn out well. So nonetheless, um, we kept out strong and we'll continue this video and we will continue this series. So thank you so much. So without further ado, we will begin with the chapter by Emilios Christodoulidis and Johann van der Waalt, and then continue to the chapter by Maria Dracopoulou. And in the end, in the style of Plutarch's Lives, we will do a comparison at the end to learn a little bit more about them as well. And as furthermore, we will also have biographies of all the authors before beginning their chapters. So, without further ado, we will begin with the former chapter. So a little biography about Emilios Christodoulidis. Um, he's a professor and chair of jurisprudence at the University of Glasgow School of Law in Scotland in the United Kingdom. Since 2010 as well, he's been the docent at the University of Helsinki in Finland, as well as a, he was previously a visiting professor at the Federal University at Recife in Brazil in 2015 and in the University of Sydney, Australia in 2014, and in the Faculty of Law in Antwerp in 2008, as well in the Belgium European Academy for Legal Theory in Brussels from 1996 to 1998. His books include Law and Reflective Politics, published by Springer Netherlands in 1998, which won the European Award for Legal Theory in 1996, and in 1998, the Society for Legal Scholars Prize for Outstanding Legal Scholarship. His recent monograph is The Redress of Law, Globalization, Constitutionalism, and Market Capture, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2021. And he's also the editor of a series of Critical Studies in Jurisprudence, published by Rutledge, and as well with um, he is an, a managing editor of the Journal of Law and Critique. His areas of interest include constitutional theory, democratic theory, critical legal theory, and tra and trans trans transitionalist theory, or, or transitionist justice. Pardon me. And as for the biography of Johann van der Waalt, he is a the. Uh, his full name is actually Johann Willem Gauss van der Walt, and he has been at the University of Luxembourg since 2011, where he is a full professor. He also held chairs at the University of Glasgow from 2007 to 2011, and in Johannesburg, South Africa from 1996 to 2006. He's also an extraordinary professor at the University of Pretoria, also in South Africa. And he has been in that position since 2009. He's the author of monographs and books, including Law and Sacrifice, published by the CRC Press in 2005, and Question of Sovereignty, published by Walter de Groyter, um, published by w Walter de Groyter in 2014, and also numerous peer-reviewed jur and journal articles and chapter contributions, including this one we are covering today. His research specialization includes philosophy of law, legal theory, and jurisprudence informed by continental European and Anglo-American traditions of philosophy, legal theory, jurisprudence, political theory, and anthropology. So their chapter is titled 
uh, is in part three of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History under Perspectives, Legal History in Modern Legal Thought, and it is titled Critical Legal Studies Europe. So this one I typed because it was one of the longer chapters, and I said, oh, this don't, don't torture yourself. Writing these uh, long notes can, can take a very long time, so type a little faster, but nonetheless. But nonetheless, the first part I did write, part of it, I'll open it up again. So they start off in section one, titled Critical Theory, European Trajectory. They say, in this chapter, we trace the tradition of critical theory in Europe in the way it has influenced and framed legal thought. A key and distinctive element of this field, of this tradition, is, the character, is that it characteristically connects to the state as a constitutive reference, and it understands law as that which organizes and mediates the relation of state to civil society. The other reference would be the uh, or the other constitutive reference is political economy, which typically grounds this tradition of thinking about law in materiality of practices of social production and reproduction. And therefore they say it is these connections of institution of law to, to, um, to, that to demarcate the state of, and political economy that um, connect the two and therefore define this area of scholarship. Therefore, legal theory locates its function, whereas the, or critical legal theory, locates its function in its emancipatory potential and obstacles uh, to emancipation. But I think the main takeaway here is that it has, critical legal studies has both an, both an, an emancipatory potential and presents obstacles of emancipation. However, there is kind of two sides of the coin. There's the one side, critical legal studies, and on the other, political economy, from uh, according to uh, the two authors in Europe, particularly. This chapter, therefore, will trace a them will take a thematic approach, explaining Hegelianism and Marxist roots, from the German side in Frankfurt School to the post-Auschwitz and as and aesthetic and communicative turn including the French side as well, from the École Normale Supérieure and leading figure, including Louis Althusser. Plus, as well, it will cover some forgotten authors. It will also cover Foucault and the, also the ENS um, school and Gramsci's theory of hegemony in Italy and a materialist constitution of Italian left from Antoine Negri's social forces. The sui generis, Strand in Britain will also be covered, including the ethical, aesthetic, and political turns, and the decisive break from Marxism in the 1980s. The Critical Legal Conference has since become the main vehicle for its expression, and Britons, like their counterparts in the U.S., distinctly have a more individualist form of critique, as will be shown, and it has later led into the development of the feminist theory, which will be covered in the next chapter. So there's a lot to cover here, and I hope you uh, bear with me, but it's uh, basically we're going to trace the history of critical legal studies in Europe through multiple geographies, particularly France, Italy, and the United Kingdom. And therefore, it will show a diverse critical understandings of the law, and that there's a contradiction between capitalism and de democracy are operative in democracies under the aegis of constitutionalism, and therefore it's a paradox of constitutionalism where there's the constituted versus the constituted power, and therefore a manifested boundary between private and public law. And the chapter will show the trajectories lie across the spectrum. So as we'll see, there's critical legal sc studies. Scholars can, although they're commonly seen of in the, uh, the left-leaning perspectives, there are also more conservative critical legal studies scholars and there's also this dichotomy between the constitutionalism in that there's the constituted and the constitutional power, and as well between capitalism and democracy. So without further ado, we will move on to section two, titled The State and the Critique of Domination, Hegel's Legacy. So we'll start off with Hegel here. They say, history is the dis dissimulating journey of the absolute through time. And this journey arrives at its destination with the con consolidation of modern statehood contended 
by Hegel in Philosophie der Gesicht, in published in 1970. They say it is dissimulating because of the way it presents absolute as a series of finitudes and partial truths. Yet throughout this journey, absolute remain absolute and finitude is not considered to be considered its facade, but its reality for the word facade does not belong to the vocabulary of the absolute. Therefore, the task of philosophy, according to Hegel, is to comprehend the relation between the eternal reality of the absolute and the dissimulation in time as a series of finitudes. So, a culmination of different finitudes, but not one finitude, or one absolute. And therefore, finitude is not a constitutive element of the absolute. The history of critique, be it philosophical or social, is a history of refusals to give up this Hegelian mythology. Mythologimi, perhaps it's pronounced mythologim. I always say if people pronounce the word, it's because they've read it before they've heard it, which I think is in some ways good, but perhaps I'm just defending myself. And also, this is true for the Marxism, Marxian critiques, in that they insist upon turning it on its head. The critique that severed the connection of what ought to be with what is would not command the comprehension it requires to figure as critique. Hegel argue, argued severing saying what is and what ought to be solen, and it terminates a meaningful assessment, supposedly. But therefore, it's still this separation of saying what is and solen what ought to be is a key, um, had a key influence on the development of critical legal studies in Europe and in other geographies. The Marxian notion of imminent critique pivots on the key on this key insight that emerged from Hegel's critique of Kant, in that their concern with history of critique keeps the Hegelian mythology in place and retains the emphasis on its centerpiece, the modern state. And we will therefore trace a number of key mutations in the course of the 20th century, and reflect on what it might mean for the critique to give up on Hegel's magnificent ruse. They call it. So essentially, if Hegel argues that there's a difference between what is and what ought to be, it sort of discounts the necessity or the value of critical legal studies, which focuses almost entirely on what ought to be. But if there is, if they are perhaps what, if they are the same, then there is no division, but then therefore more necessity of critical legal studies. But nonetheless, we will continue in to track how this, and essentially, this this Marxian notion came in response to Kant and therefore influenced critical legal studies. And my apologies that there's a lot of philosophers here that um, each have their uh, so much deep philosophy that it would be hard to cover them all here, but hopefully you're kind of tracking this progression where we go from Hegel um, and Kant as well and then lead into Marxism. And then critical legal studies largely came after as kind of a uh, the next development after Marxism. And as we'll see, perhaps feminism and critical race studies came as an extension of critical legal studies. But each, as they kind of passed, its waves kind of took away from the previous studies, or at least attracted greater popularity away from. So, moving to part A of this section, the significance of the state in the history of critique. So they say, critique as we know it always occurs in the context of and takes its opportunity from a long history of theological, ontological, and sociological division. Therefore, the engagement with this history begins with the faltering of the Eubesian myth that considered the Roman emperor as the incarnation of divine providence. Therefore, association and dissociation of law and the will of the emperor in Roman law was one of the foundational divisions of between law and um, perhaps the theological or ontological um, powers. Similar division uh, was already evident in the se separation of the potestas and occitoritas during the early time of the early Ro Roman Republic, and one might further conceive the Eubesian myth emerged in Roman legal imagination to host a series of new myths regarding the division of finite and infinite power. For example, the two swords are called in medieval Christian imagination sought to settle the long history of battles between the emperor and later king and the clergy. So the clergy, so the separation basically, once again, was also evident in um, Christian um, development in that there was a separation between 
the kings and the clergy, as well as we saw in Rome, and the symbolic separation of the king's terrestrial body and the celestial body. And it caused a reduction of the king to a cultural relic and less to a, um, you know, essentially took away from his powers. And the modern state had no option but to internalize this dialectic and to internalize, and the internalization became the birth scene of social critiques associated with modernity and with Hegel and Marx in particular. So this is kind of the, as soon as there was a separation between the kings and the religious authority, there was in, in a dichotomy, and from there all of the dichotomies have come in that there's a separation between the what is and what ought to be, as we saw with Hegel, and then further into Marxism and as well um, critical legal studies. Moving to section B, back to Hegel and the internalization of critique in the, mo in the context of the modern state. So they say, the key feature of the modern state remains its concern with a constitutive division or split. Nicholas, according to Nicholas Luhmann, that was a quote by Nicholas Luhmann, and the state has to justify itself to and in society because we have this division. If the state was had godlike authority, then it would not need to justify itself. Therefore, Hegel's conception, which takes over this principle of division, but inverses the foundation, foundational relation, never received a real following, according to them. The author is concerned with the passage, not the cleaving force between civil society and, and the state proper, but with the reference, but with reference to Hegel. So supposedly they say this author, Lumen, said Hegel never received a following. But they're not suggesting that Hegel was at odds with the overwhelming evidence and never received a following, but it refers to the fact that Hegel's justification of civil society as object of justification, justification never received a following. But nonetheless, these are sort of speed bumps in the development of critical legal studies. But as soon as we have this separation of sane and solon, we have a necessity of, of critical legal studies. Therefore, and then they present a Hegel passage, which I won't read the entirety, but they essentially they say, although civil society is a strong driving force, class divisions need to be controlled by the state, according to Hegel. Therefore, national socialism put this into serious question later, however, and the Marxist notion as well, and that the state largely influenced by the elite and private interests. Post-Marxist end of critical theory advocate a co-originality, according to Haberman, and a continued continuity between legislative and executive functions as long as it remains sufficiently undistorted by the system systemic logics of money and bureaucracy. Therefore, it's a spectrum. But Hegel's following merely transferred in that the will of the sovereign statehood reassert itself as an emancipatory form of social organization or it will too evidently become reduced to a useful obfuscation of social forces that have no concern with emancipatory ideals of modernity. So essentially this Hegelian notion that there's a separation between sane and solon, which also probably derives from earlier separation of king and um, godlike power, had influenced this Martian, Marxian notion that the state is controlled by the elites and that therefore there is just what is and not what ought to be, but there's uh, further extension into critical legal studies, and this is kind of where the, the birthplace of critical legal studies in my mind exists. So moving to section three, critical theory as ideo ideology critique. So if the return to Hegel allowed us to recover the critical vein of Marxism from the standpoint of its own philosophical foundation and to focus it on the critique Critique of domination, or Herrscherkraft, that's German. Another vein can be shown to take its cue from Hegel's dialectical method for purposes of articulating a critical ideology, ideology critic. So there's this other element we have the from the dialectical method of Hegel also influencing critical legal studies, not just the critique of domination which we can, I think that's the best way of summing up that original, the, the critique of domination started with the critique of the separation between the king and religious authority, and then to Hegel's uh, sane and soul and what is and what ought to be, and then into Marxism in that the state um, is influenced by elites and private interests and therefore needs to be controlled, 
But then we also have this other element, the dialectical method from Hegel. So part A of this section called imminent critique. So turning to Marx to manifest this, to the process of production and social reproduction to identify the locus of critique, the basic categories of the oppression of economy and the material production of society are expressions of capitalist relations, according to the Marxists. And they constantly mediated through basic categories of private law that give expression to them as acts of freedom and autonomous agency. The critical element appears both at the level of experience of meaning and of structure slash agency. So it's just a brief summarization of Marxism, but if you'd like a more detailed explanation, there's a, a full chapter on Marxism actually by the editor, Christopher Tomlins. So for the juncture of meaning, and that which we have already covered, for the juncture of meaning, construction and agency can begin with the notion of imminent critiques to capture the idea of theory as practical, engaged activity. According to Marx Horkheimer, referring to Kant's transcendental condition of knowledge, critical thought must presuppose the existence of its object, and that both the object and subjective experience and differences between what law promises, freedom, equality, self-determination, and what it delivers. Therefore, this imminence, which is the difference, the, perhaps the separation of what law promises and what it delivers. Imminence, in other words, always already implicated the historically posed, necessarily unfinished nature of human engagement. So there's this historical aspect, hence why it's in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, but also because they're tracing this critical legal studies in a historical manner, but not all the chapters have been like this. Which suggests that the engagement is not something subject can stand back from, but one that comes upon them with a force of present distress, which they need to make rational. So this constant imminence, this constant the law is never complete, but always in a process of becoming, and therefore quite historical as well. Therefore the inaugural gesture of critical thought is reflexivity over its own partiality. Moving to part B, the dialectic of subjectivity. So they say the history and theory of the subject that is of an agency that is actively engaged in the formation of the social world is central to the conceptual development of critique and critical theory that would come to the fore in a dialectic thought of Hegel and Marx. Two, they look at two key moments, for, namely the revitalization of the dialectic of subjectivity the thought of George Lucas, Lukacs, and in its out, out undoing in the work of Theodore, Theodore Andoro, and they represent key moments in the trajectory of European critical thought. So there's this this kind of this separation, this re, this revitalization of this dialectic from George Lucas, which um, this dialectic, as we discussed, largely from Hegel and then the undoing of it by Theodore and Doro, but they're both key elements in the critical legal studies in Europe. The central concern of Lucas' epochal, epochal revision of Marxist thinking was the rehabilitation of the dialectic between a subject and object and the reinstating of the revolutionary subject, considered both elements to have disappeared from the late phase of Marx's work. Therefore, he turned to the leadership of the Communist Party as he saw that the proletariat itself was so implicated in the reflection of reification of social relations and in response to German idealism and historical materialism. And he published a work in 1923 that may be considered the last major aspirational conception of orthodox, rel relatively orthodox Marxism to invoke the utopian potential embodied in the discourse of the proletariat and epistemological leadership of the Communist Party. Before the disaster of the Stalin-Hitler Pact derailed the current Marxist thinking for good in, in 1939, at least as far as Western Marxism is concerned. So this individual, Lucas, kind of large, was a very influential figure in uh, the development of Marxism, but he also took this dialectic, but more specifically a dialectic between a separation between subject and object. So these dialectics can occur across different trajectories. This was his and uh, it largely influenced the Communist Party and therefore Marxism going into the Communist Party. One of the most pertinent responses to the disaster came from the two social theorists from the Frankfurt School, Max Horkheimer and Theodore Andoro, in a co-authored essay, The Dialectic of Enlightenment, 
published in 1944. So this is the undoing previously discussed. And it convents with an, an equation of the subject of formation and reification. The subject itself a product of reification and dominance and can therefore be invoked for purposes of contemplating a re revolutionary de-reification of social relations. And with their uh, book titled Negative Dialectics in 1966, so very clearly out outdoing what uh, Lukacs had done in 1966, in a passage by Theodore Adorno marked critical theories despairing withdrawal from the philosophy of the subject and the whole legacy of German idealism. Therefore saying, enlightenment thus transcends its traditional self-understanding, it is demythologization that is important. So not mythologization, demythologization. And therefore it is obvious the subject, according to Adorno, the very product and vehicle of dominance can no longer enter into an emancipatory dialect with the object. So therefore there's probably um, only the object or only the subject, but not the two, or they're not exactly equals. Therefore critical theory should shield itself from the domination of subjectivity so therefore maybe focus solely on the object. Therefore negative dialectics is itself an attempt to resist the conceptual grasping of the object, the key concern of German idealism. So it's also kind of a contract, like going back on German idealism as well, an undoing of German idealism. And therefore to develop a method of conceptual constellations that circle the object instead of grasping it directly. The, he took leave of Lukács dialectic reconciliation between subject and object and pursuit negative dialectic that stressed the recognition of non-identity and lack of reconciliation between subject and object as a last resort for the pro promise of a reconciled mankind. Therefore, the, the failure to let go of the subject-object orientation, according to Andorno, it was the essential legacy of German idealism. So to get rid of this German idealism, which was out of fashion after the Second World War. This is what Adorno's objective was, and he did, however, mention the artistic institutions in his work, of, such as the artistic flashes of lightning. So perhaps there is this, um, and, but he did not th did not detain him, but would become an arresting work, resting in the work of Jean Francois Lyotard, to be discussed. So. There, he says that everything is based essentially on these, um, not focus on the object directly, but on the what that which goes around it. But then he notes in art there are these flashes of lightning, so maybe there are there is something directly unique to the object. So in he did kind of leave a, a door open, even though he largely did endeavor to out undo the work of Lucas and this dialectic between subject and object which is an extension of the, the, the dialectic between Sane and Solon, as hypothesized by Hegel. Moving to section C, from the history of the subject to the future of the event. So if the transformation of the critical project can be seen as a move from the dialectic of the subject to a focus on the event, as discussed by Andorno, it is because the unfolding of subjectivity in history could not guarantee that it would resist the reification that the history of capitalism relentlessly imposed upon it. According to the authors, this is the story of the negative dialectic and is also clearly expressed in the emphatically anti-Hegelian current of Marxism association with the rise of the structuralist thought. Amongst most important are the his theories emanated from the École Normale Supérieure in Paris around the key figure Louis Althusser. So he was one of the, the last Marxist, as we discussed in Christopher Tomlin's chapters, and perhaps the most typical exponent of the anti-Hegelian structuralist current of Marxism, so against that current of Marxism, with its emphasis on structural determination of subject positions and possibilities of actions without dialectical overcoming to contest bourgeois democracy demands a complete transcendence of its terms and the judicial juridical conditions that determine the construction of sense. Only revolution can comply with the demand for the exhaustive transcendence. So once again, kind of going along with Andorno's um, philosophy in that there's a, with an emphasis on structural determination, 
but as as Andorno did note, there are perhaps things unique to the object, such as in art, perhaps. A uh, similar impasse relating to the subject position is posed by the, and this is from the ENS, the Ecole Normale Superior in Paris, so this is the French strain as we see. So. Similar impasse relating to the subject position is posed by the tradition of revolutionary syndicalism in Italy and post gramascian currents in the autonomous syndicalist movements. And if to speak of constituent power is to speak of democracy, as Antonio Negri put it, in his opening statement in Il Potor Constituent, the fact that it appears as constitutional, that is, comes always already implicated with constitutional forms, means that democracy is already straightjacketed to the conditions of the limitations of the capitalist legality. Therefore, the therefore we get to this dichotomy that the constitution does not necessarily align with the con or constitution are not necessarily aligned with a constituent power. In, a much, in his much celebrated later work, Empire, Negri asks, how can the subject claim a truly revolutionary speaking position that is not already contaminated by a system of capitalist social reproduction? So once again, is there this thing unique to the object or is it all the result of circumstances? which is a largely a critical legal studies. That's one of the main essences of critical legal studies, but it also, once again, draws its roots from uh, Hegelism and uh, the work of um, Adorno and all these individuals as well. But this is Negri in Italy bringing a similar response, but once again, in response to capitalism. And draws from an earlier opresmo movement in the 1960s, that formed the springboard for the autonomous current of the Italian Marxism in the 1970s, which Negri was a leading figure of. So Negri was a leading figure of the Italian Marxist movement. The self-identification of the proletariat as a potential revolutionary subject is always already undercut, and autonomia, autonomia was therefore undertaken in terms of refusal to work, wildcat strikes, spontaneous slowdowns, acts of sabotage, and bad faith reformism, and it was therefore purely negative forms of uh, uh, fighting against the state, essentially. Yet empire, in Empire Negri does not take a positive turn to transferring a distinct di distinction between potential force and potestas, or authority and command, so, and that he borrows from Spinoza into politics. Um, the, so I also have a video, a lecture on Spinoza as well, a full biography as well, but this difference between potential and protestas, authority and command, so our, um, he borrows from Spinoza. And there's the, a possible to subordinate the concept of sovereignty or the protestas to its continuing actualization in potential. And potential in turn becomes, ter in term becomes term for constituent power. And therefore, once we get we to return to the dialectic between subject and the object. Also supported in Negri's insurgencies, there's the subject of constituent power is only ever the insurgent subject, the emergent property of action, and not its instigator or agent. And perhaps an over-determinization of contradictions, as Althusser described elsewhere, it is still, but still, dialectic. And therefore, a note written in response to global capitalism is, is perhaps over-exaggerated. Um, so perhaps the, the note is that the responses between the global capital, capitalism is perhaps over-exaggerated, and in many ways, Negri does recognize these dialectics, whether they be the Spinozan type or they be the constitution versus the constitution type. Moving to the next section, theorizing the event. So what remains to be thought in view of the moments of critique traced above its, is its transformation from a concern with subjectivity to concern with the event, and more specifically from a concern with the subjectivity as irreducibly determined by history. To the event is conception of an undetermined and unprecedented future. For this purpose of contemplating this transformation, they situate Negri's concern with an always insurgent subjectivity, this imminence we mentioned earlier, that resists the reduction of constituent 
to constituting power within the development of critical legal theory of Lucas and Adorno, and the emergence of the event in the host of late 20th century thinkers of whom the work of Alain Badiot and Jean-Francois -François Lyotard can be selected as representatives. So these are also important intell intellectuals who, to varying degrees, influenced critical legal studies in Europe. Leotard, for example's engagement with the avant-garde art discussed previously as Adorno kind of opened the door to uh, avant-garde art theor themized the anxious concern with the artist with the irreducibly uncertain uncertainty and unpredictability of the event and therefore the the irreducible the irreducibly unpredictability of the there is at the, or the il yam in le différent in his book in his own words, would be nothing but addressing the question whether something cruel happen, cruel happen, could be happening and thinking of an event concerned for him the ultimate resistance to the instrumental use of time. So I guess it's best manifested in art. Is there really this something unique to the object or is it all just influenced by that which surrounds it? And exactly this impetus that was one of that one discerns in Negri's concerns with constituent power that refrains from the subject formations that are nothing but continuation of already available histories or uniqueness, but it is still in response to a constituent power, perhaps. So this, once again, this, if this constituent power or this power existing is just the result of history, there's not really much influence that the constituents can have. The Badius, uh, uh, Bad, Badio, pardon me, uh, pardon, at least contests Negri frontally um, in that the reach into which that which Negri assumes to be the undetermined multiplicity is always and can be directed by and thus contained within what he calls the situation. Subject is nothing beyond the situation. Totality, while negation is crucial for breaking out of the confinement of the situation, it cannot avoid playing a, front, a functional role within the situation. So the, um, it inevitably has a function within the situation, yet still holds a possibility of critique and therefore resistance of the idea of the event. The event cannot be inferred from the situation. An event is something that can only be said to exist in so far as it somehow inspires subjects to wager on its existence. So it's so like there's, think of it, uh, uh, I see it as probabilities. Let's say the event is 90% probable. The subject still has to make that bet. Therefore, it's chance and yet undecidably from within the situation itself. First, um, you can also see a reference to the first law of thermodynamics and that total energy of an isolated system which cannot exchange or exchange matter is constant. So. That, that was the way I imagined it, is that in a closed system, the this uh, potentiality has to already exist in the system, and it still cannot assert what will happen. But sometimes you can guess what might be the outcome. So I think the, the Adorno and um, Grasky are kind of, they kind of put away temporarily or try to argue against this these dialectics, which are necessary to critical legal studies, but they were sort of, op they still opened up doors, such as that in art, or such as that in uh, constitutionalism, for the constitution versus the constitution, um, uh, sorry, the constituted versus the constitutional power. So they still opened doors and still push for the discussions in critical legal studies in France and Italy, respectively. So to the conclusion, the section four, the critical concern with the event and the emergence of radical utopian possibilities of action that is at stake in the contemplation of constituent power in terms of itself and not in terms of something else is irreconcilable with the critical concern of normative framework of the state and the whole gamut of constituted power implied by this normative framework. Nevertheless, the task of critical theory is not to neglect either of these possibilities of critique. So whether they're on, depending on what end of the spectrum they are between the, this di these dialectics, whether they absolutely don't believe it exists or 
absolutely do believe, I think to some extent they have to believe it exists, they, um, there's a, a, a variation in critical legal studies scholars in Europe, as they discuss, and I think I would argue the same is also true in North America. The critical concern with the event and the emergence of radical, um, and so, but they notice there's a few things to note. One, the critique begins in the context of the articulation of specific constellations of meaning, where the creation of meaning occurs in terms of specific imaginaries with their vocabularies and rules of specification. It also occurs in the context of specific sets of social relations, institutional arrangements and processes of social reproduction in both senses, always in media res, media res or the middle ground. Second thing to note, critique involves the acquisition of distance from the conceptual forms that determine identity and action. And this distance cannot and does not assume or imply fully fledged reflexivity, but it does allow for the introduction of contingency where necessi necessity is assumed. Therefore, critical perspective is one that fastens onto contradiction, a term under which we can subsume also fundamental inconsistencies such as silences, exclusions, discrepancies between what the system promises and what it is capable of delivering, and not likely as capable carries a structural limitation. For example, the capitalist labor market cannot deliver a promise of full employment because it requires structural element of unemployment to make itself itself a market. So there is if there's no such thing as absolute capitalism there can be no such thing as absolute Marxism, and therefore critical legal studies, although many believe or perceive, foresee it, lies more on the left, it is actually um, nuanced, and there are conservatives and liberals within the critical legal studies scholarship. And where contradictions have been tracked, ideology critique aims to expose them as a systematic expression of dominant interests irrespective of whether they are class interests or whether they pertain to gender, race, or underlie other forms of oppression. So therefore, critical legal studies largely takes this image as um, representing the repressed, but then they have kind of extended into newer forms of scholarship, such as feminist legal studies or, fe or feminism gen more generally and critical legal studies more generally. And ideology critique approximates the critique of domination most clearly with these particular interests combined into hegemonic constellations. So I think it's kind of um, to, analogous to the uh, Tolstoyan versus Carlyle's uh, arguments in that Tolstoy said, believed in um, at the end of War and Peace, he writes in his um, epilogues that to what extent was Napoleon actually responsible for the, the, um, the invasion of the countries and attack ultimately upon Russia, and he said it was actually most likely because he was the most efficient cog in the wheel, and that he gave the people what they wanted, not because he was especially unique. And he directly contrasts Carlyle, who said, who believed in hero worship, and that history is made up by many individuals making changes. So critical legal studies lies on the end of the spectrum, close to Tolstoy in that it's circumstances and such, but there always are these di these dialectics, such as what Hegel noted, the sane and solon, and even critical legal studies, or the what is and what ought to be, even critical legal studies scholars, and all of them do um, do uh, take note of these dialectics. Yet, and critical legal studies scholars in the European examples all present an element of individuality and a separation of subject and object. So therefore, once again, a spectrum. So I hope you enjoyed that chapter. There's a lot of uh, big words and a lot of references to many important philosophers, but I hope that was a useful, as useful an overview of critical legal studies in Europe as it was for me. So without further ado, we will discuss the chapter, uh, the uh, slide we have here if you are watching the video. So starting with Emilius Christio Dulidis, he's, his institution is the University of Glasgow School of Law where he is the chair of jurisprudence, and he is also the docent at, of the University of Helsinki in Finland, uh, and Glasgow is in Scotland. Uh, suggested readings include The Redress of Law, Globalization, Constitutionalism, and Market Capture, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2021, 
Textbook Jurisprudence, Themes, and Concepts, published in three editions, first edition in 2007, most recent edition in 2018, published by the Rutledge Cavendish Press, and the third book, Law and Reflexive Politics, published by the Kluwer Academic Publishers in 1998. Moving to Johan van der Walt, his institution, the University of Luxembourg, his position is a full professor and he is also an extraordinary professor at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Suggested readings include The Concept of Liberal Democratic Law, published by Rutledge in 2019, um, Constitutional Sovereignty and Social Solidarity in Europe, published with Gauss J. and Jeffrey E. No Nomos, uh, Jeffrey E., published by the Nomos Bloomsbury Publishing Company in 2015. And third book, The Horizontal Effect, Revolution, and the Question of Sovereignty, published by Walter de Gruyter in 2014. So, once again, their chapter, their chapter is in section 3, Perspectives, Legal History, and Modern Legal Thought. Chapter 31, Critical Legal Studies, Europe, is the title of it in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. And lastly, to the quotes. First quote, a key distinctive element a key and distinctive element of this legal tradition is that it characteristically connects the state and constitutive reference as constitutive reference. In other words, it understands the institution of law as that which organizes and mediates the relation of the state to civil society. The other constitutive reference is political economy, a reference that typically grounds the tradition of thinking about law and materiality of the practice of social production and reproduction. Where contradictions have been tracked, ideology critique aims to expose them as a systematic expression of dominant interests, irrespective of whether they are class interests or whether they pertain to gender, race, or underlying other forms of oppression, so leading to the extensions upon critical legal studies. And last quote, ideology critique approximates the critique of domination most clearly when these particular interests combine in hegemonic constellations. So that is the chapter by Emilios Christio Dulidis and Johan van der Waal. We'll now move on to the chapter by Maria Dracopoulou. Um, and we'll continue and we'll talk briefly about the previous two authors a little bit more in the comparison at the end in the style of Plutarch's Parallel Fires. So Maria Dracopoulou's chapter is in, well, also in part three, Perspectives, Legal History in Modern Legal Thought. And it's chapter 32 of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History titled Feminist history, Historiography of Law, an Exposition and Proposition. So, to start off with her biography, which I have written on my journal. I can find it. So, she is a professor of law and co-director of the Center for Critical Thought at the University of Kent, Kent Law School. And at uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, it's uh, it's e east south of London near Dover so I think it's important to note that it's kind of Dover is an interesting city and in that it's kind of it's as close to mainland Europe as you can get and it's often where people would tra will do travel between England and France. There are boats to Calais fr France as well. Um, her prior academic pr um, professor um, at practice she's prior to being an academic professor she practiced criminal law as a barrister in the Athens bar in Greece she held the Jean Monnet fellowship at the European University Institute and was a visiting scholar in Australia Finland Greece Germany Italy and Sweden as well held scholarly positions in Sweden Finland and the United Kingdom She's currently the co-holder of the AHRB, which is a funded the Law and Human Research Network, and the E, and as well as on the E board of the Feminist at Law E Journal, and the um, as well the Anthem Handbooks of Critical Thought, also on the executive board of the Anthem Handbooks of Critical Thought as well. She's part of the Society of Legal Scholars in the United Kingdom. The Association of Critical Legal Scholars, also in the United Kingdom, and the American Association for the Study of Law, Culture, and the Humanities. 
She's also an external examiner of the Master of Law, the LLM, at King's College London, which um, one of the uh, co-workers I work with, the prosecutor, Kareem A. Khan, went to King's College London as well, so not just... Um, he's very the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, a very important lawyer as well, so also a very important influence that Maria Dragopoulou has here. She's edited books including The Feminist Encounters with Legal Philosophy, published by the Rutledge Cavendish Press in 2013, as well as a special issue, History, Space and Time, published by the Australian Feminist Journal in 2013, where she was co-editor with J. Chriso Stalis. Her research interests include feminist and political theory, continental feminist philosophy, com continental feminist philosophy, post-colonial theory, history and historiography, legal philosophy, feminist jurisprudence, and her teaching includes undergraduate critical law with an interest in political and post-colonial theories, and at a graduate level with a focus on law and the humanities. So, with a Further ado, her chapter is titled Feminist Historiography of Law and Exposition and Proposition, Chapter 32 of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. So starting off with Section 1, Introduction, or What's in a Name. So what does this mean for women? This she is a quote from Mary Linton Shanley in her Suffrage, Protective Labor, Legislation, and Married Women's Property Laws in England, published in 1986. And the Signs, Volume 12, published by the University of Chicago Press, 1986. And she's, uh, Maria Dracopoulou says, With this simple question, Shanley delimited the parameters of an ascent form of historical scholarship emerging in the U.S. Academy, that of women's legal history. The individual studies deemed to belong to this new field shared neither a common ideology nor a common theoretical approach or methodology. They are united by orientation of legal historical inquiry with its core focus directed at addressing Shanley's essential concerns, namely, why, how, in what ways does law in all its historical instantiations matter for women? She says, from the outset, feminist legal history, historians in the United States of America openly declared their alliance with the two major disciplinary developments that had taken place in the 1970s, namely, those of critical legal theory and women's history. So this is um, feminist historiography of law is aligned with either or both critical legal theory, as discussed in the previous chapter, and women's history. And it shared a critical spirit that undermined the former to unsettle the mainstream histories of law and adopted the latter, the matter of the latter, to correct the historical narrative by instituting women firmly within it, so for very different reasons yet also pointed out significant differences marking the emphasis on their own inquiry. For example, while critical legal history showed little if any real interest in women, women's history tended to touch upon law in superficial and peripheral ways, sometimes treating it as something of a digression that is critical legal history. Its affiliations were by no means fixed of the two bound the two, the bond between feminist legal history and women's history was closer and the more varied in form, both in terms of institutional and conceptual nature. So if between the two, critical legal history and women's history, feminist historiography of law might be, according to Maria Dracopoulou, closer to women's history, but nonetheless, the former neglected women and the latter in some ways neglected law. Therefore, the emergence of feminist legal history as an academic subject, particularly facilitated by the institutional gains feminist historians made in the 1970s, when the first symposium devoted to feminist legal history was held at Akron Law School in Ohio in 2007, it was against the background of a supportive and cooperative intellectual milieu provided by numerous meetings and conferences of feminist historians held over the previous 20 years. And it drew on works such as Joan Scott, Richard Morris's, and Richard Morris's overview of the rights, women's rights in the early American law and in studies in the, in the history of American law, and Mary Bird's Beard's 1946 pioneering study, Women as a Force in History. And they sometimes collectively and 
employed the term new women's legal history. So perhaps it had already existed, but there wasn't quite this synergy. But nonetheless, even at its inception, they started right out of the gate calling it new women's legal history. And it sig signified a reformulation of the relationship with the past, but also reflected its position in respect to the present and future. With bonds to feminist history extended, the reach beyond its natural environment in law schools, conceding the past or the doctrinal for the interdisciplinarity, which as we discussed in uh, Marcus Dubber's chapter, the differences between doctrinalism and interdisciplinarity. And it authorized its own singularity while embedding a, in a specific academic transition. So it combines the two because it's interdisciplinary, but it's also doctrinal and therefore securing itself for the future and came known in from the 1980s as new women's legal history to the 2000s interchangeably referred to as gender and legal history or feminist legal history more commonly now yet in the english academy neither a clearly dead in english meaning the united kingdom academy nearly a neither a clearly designated institutional space of enunciation nor a group of scholars openly claiming identity as feminist legal historians. In contrast to North America, English women's history conferences have been practically no, have had been practically no contributions devoted to feminist legal history or women's legal history with the same holding true for the biannual British Legal History Conference. So this merger hadn't quite occurred in England as it did in the United States or uh, perhaps Canada as well. Or, similarly, with the exception of just two papers, no presence in the Journal of Legal History since it was first published in 1979, um, only in to um, cover this topic, women's legal history. Only in 2016, the United Kingdom Feminist Legal Scholars, in collaboration with the Women's History Network, first organized a national academic event explicitly devoted to feminist legal history which included a one-day conference entitled Doing Women's Legal History. So only in 2016 was it actually get um, direct attention. Therefore, the virtual absence of feminist legal historians in the United Kingdom can largely be accounted for by the manner in which the feminist project in law was conceived. Firmly locating itself within the legal acad academy from its inception, it was allied to socio-legal and critical legal studies sharing an interest in laws and social context with the former and a focus on the interrelationships between theory and practice with the later. And it also adopted a pr particular critical spirit, often a Marxist orientation, alongside an understanding of modern law as a structure of power. Therefore, modern feminist legal interventions in England were therefore principally shaped by an, an, an analytical concern with the power of law. So. In England, they more clearly came from critical legal studies, which conveniently we just cut, stu covered critical legal studies in Europe, but less of a focus on women's history as a field, and therefore less of a merger between the two. And in honoring its links with feminist activism, a wish to respond to its own critiques by correcting laws wrongs towards women, and hence a desire for a politics of legal change. So critical legal studies, unlike women's history, has more of a... Um, a positive application or a, a positive in the sense of action rather than um, uh, commentary. As a result, English feminist legal history developed almost exclusively outside of the law school. Mostly it was done by feminist historians rather than scholars of law with the concomitant absence of any assertions that the history belongs to the genre of feminist legal history. So although critical legal studies did cover it, it did not receive specific attention. And then on the women's history side, it paid less attention to law than as in the United States or Canada. This discussion limited to development in the USA and England is, she said, according to the author, is not attributable attributed to the special significance to these jurisdictions, nor an interest to study them comparatively, but as they compromise two fundamentally different modalities through which the field has developed. So there are two ends of the spectrum, but not some bias in choosing them. The former thriving in the institutional and professional awareness of feminist legal historians enjoy independent life with confidence in its present and productive optimism for its future, 
and with the latter in its overtly political orientation towards legal changes that benefit women in nurturing indifference to historical inquiry and effectively assigns such inquiry to history rather than law and therefore the two modalities can be thought to occupy opposite ends of the spectrum of possible variations along which other jurisdictions of english-speaking world can be positioned so although i mentioned canada canada lies perhaps in between the united states and england or as same for other english countries such as australia for example australia as the in in a matter akin to England's, had neither constituted as a distinct field nor resides within the law school. Yet in Canada, though not nearly as rich in outputs, level of persistence or intensity or of self-reflexivity as the U.S., historical studies of women and law have secured institutional and intellectual recognition as an independent field of legal inquiry. So Canada is more similar to the United States and Australia is more similar to the United Kingdom on this spectrum. The presence of distinct modalities shaping the appearance of feminist legal history raises questions as to how we might best think of it as a unified field and therefore define its boundaries and decide what to include and what criteria might we use in doing so. Yet what follows in this chapter neither engages directly with such normative issues nor seeks to offer a blueprint as to how the field should be delimited. The intention is not to be prescriptive but in discussing the field's fortunes it is necessary to consider how it was conceived of as a unified field of study. For instance, paper adopts, the paper adopts Shanley's view that the category women's legal history or feminist legal history embraces all those studies which, while employing a historical perspective, interrogate the different ways in which women and law relate to each other, bringing together the dyad women and law together with historical inquiry as definitive components. In adopting this pro approach, fo following divided, the following chapter, which we will be discussing, is divided into two parts. First, sur it will survey the current state of the field, and by setting aside national boundaries and disciplinary origins, pays attention to broader themes, topics, and issues of feminist legal history has chosen to privilege. And the second section, building upon this presentation, will offer a, a critical understanding of what exists by drawing attention not only to the thematics of feminist legal history, but also to the process of its production, in particular the implications of the interdisciplinary nature. And finally, also in second, second section, the second part in pursuing a critical account of the work produced will briefly considers the possibilities for otherwise thinking of and doing feminist legal history. Therefore, this chapter is titled, or with a subscript, an exposition and a proposition. So part one is the exposition and part two includes the proposition. So moving to part, uh, the first part, but it's section two of the chapter of three, men Menocene or the writing of women's legal histories. So Menocene, M-N-E-M-O-S-Y-N-E, -E, was a Greek goddess of memory and the mother of the nine muses and to her nephew. So she had nine children, muses with her nephew, Zeus. And she's actually the fifth wife of seven, which I think is, um, not going to a tangent, but almost in some ways ironic that she might be the symbol of feminism if she's the fifth of seven wives of Zeus and even his aunt. So I don't think it's really a, but nonetheless, she is seen as one of the leaders of um, uh, feminism in that she had nine muses who were all very influential women and she was influential in her own right and maybe maybe that might be the epitome of women um, feminism in that she was okay with this um, and strong but nonetheless that is the title or menozine or the writing of women's legal histories please let me know what you think of that um, the men being the historian they sel seldom condescend to record the great or, and good actions of women, according to Mary Estelle in Christian Religion, published by the Bridget, published in Bridget Hill, um, the published with Bridget Hill as an editor in the first English Feminists in 1986. Writing women in the history of law was and still is the feminist legal historian's original and most significant pledge. By capturing women's past encounters with law, they can dispel the leaf 
of legal records will cover what ha which has been obliterated and correct the distortions and omissions made by the dominant male memory. Many varieties emanated from law schools, history schools, and women's studies departments, but irrespective of their locus of production can be assigned to one of two major categories. First, directed at the close scrutiny of law broadly conceived and its treatment of women in different historical periods, and second, posing women rather than law as its starting point, focused on women's attitudes to law, their thoughts and activities with reference to law, and their contributions to the legal sphere. And therefore, I think this could be seen as a, a top-down versus a bottom-up approach, as previously discussed in political legal studies, as well as social or cultural legal studies. The former originally focused on women's place, namely the so-called private sphere and realm mostly closely, closely associated with women's confinement and oppression, and nonetheless law governing women's public standing was not neglected. The focus on the severe limitations law imposed on women's capacity to be recognized as persons and as free agents in the public sphere. The debate arose originally from feminist historians to feminist legal history, and therefore whether the juxtaposition between private and public dichotomy provided an important analytical framework within which to explore the relationship between law and the place of role and men in society. So this, um, this dichotomy can also be manifested in public and private law, however there's much overlap. For example, feminists looked also beyond traditional sources of law, focusing also on focusing also on primary sources such as legal archives, legislative and parliamentary records, and court records and proceedings. Further recognition of differences within the category of women also contributed significantly to the diversity of work and the methodological shift from sameness to difference brought the new concept of gender a preferred term because it testifies to female and male identities as construal constructs instead of biologically given. So this shift to the word um, gender studies also led to the new field of legal history, that of masculinity and men's studies as well. Unlike the former, going to the bottom up approach, positing law as the effects on women's lives as its object of inquiry, the second explores the nature of the relationship from the opposite direction, from the perspective of women, their effects on the law, using opportunity, intervention, cunning, and wit often exercising considerable courage in the process, shown important movers and shakers, first work stories, anecdotal, and therefore once again bottom up. And not always a collective struggle, frequently used existing law and courts to their advantage. So it's not just struggle, there's also many great positive things that happen and are covered in these studies. Um, they frequently used existing law to their advantage, for example, in forms of petitions, in court, in divorce suits and rape charges of rape, and in turn attempted to bypass the stringent limitations law imposed upon them. They, they exposed loopholes and gaps in laws, contributed to the often heated contestations and controversies, including those concerning suffrage, the abolition of laws protecting women's labor, prostitution, and the repeal of the Contagious Diseases Act, and the nature of love and the institution of marriage. There are also claims that women's criminals who, through their crimes, were seen to have inserted themselves on behalf of the female sex, which was often a very um, uh, sexist practice where they said that um, women committed the crime on behalf of the sex, not on behalf of their own um, accord, and therefore caused um, scrutiny towards the group rather than the individual. And integration of women into history of law could not be com completed without sharing the histories of the main protagonists in women's battles with law. So kind of once again going to Carlyle's approach as opposed to Tolstoy in that there are individuals who have effects. Therefore, there are heroic individuals, radical fighters, radicals, fighters, and champions of specific causes while respecting the subject's ideas and ideologies as well as the differences according to race, class, religion, and other qualifications. So to draw a parallel to the previous chapter on critical legal studies, there is a spectrum in feminist legal history in that there is, um, once again, a dichotomy between um, circumstance and uh, volition in that, or once again, Tolstoy, the result of circumstances, or Carlyle, heroism.
So moving to section three and the last section, which would be the proposition. And it's titled Forgetfulness or the Paradox of Feminist Legal Historiography. I'm trying to go back through all those places where I was exiled and closed so he could constitute his there. To read his text, to try to take back from it from what he took from me irrevocably. I am trying to rediscover the possibility of a relation to air. Don't I need one? Well, before starting to speak. This is a, a quote from Lucy Irigaray. 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 Pardon me. In the Forget Forgetting Air, published in 1999. So just kind of a to get, get the mood, but it's also very, uh, how difficult it can be for sometimes, often, for women to share their, what happened, and that's why there's this, um, that perhaps some of the scholarship has been held back, because some of the topics are very sensitive, and, and they can only be shared by women, but often they're not comfortable or feel safe doing so. So the preceding review offered an exposition of the field in terms of its substantive context, content as a history of the relationship between women and law, paying attention to the modes in which the relationship was conceived, examined, and concluded. It arranged the histories according to two major themes, namely law's treatment of women and women's attitude to law. So it's kind of top down and bottom up, and also the dichotomy that's also manifested in critical legal studies. The critical approach to be adopted in this section requires a closer and different kind of scrutiny, shifting the attention up to the thematics of the field an account of the modality of the two major constitutive themes, the intellectual and political alignments that have shaped their identity and their directional form, allows a critical appreciation of their efficacy as well as their sense of achievement in and contribution to furthering the topics of inquiry. Of their inquiries, so, so in many ways to unite these two approaches. So situated between law and history, particularly the feminist permutations of each, Feminist legal history, a combination of all three, occupies no fixed abode, according to the author, Maria Dracopoulou. Um, nonetheless, it maintains strong links to both fields, that being law and history, and each link, however, is of a different nature. To law, it is indebted, indebted to the substantive content and to the object of inquiry, women and law. Law fundamentally affects women's social being, to, and to history, it turns to its own gifts upon the law. So once again, a top-down and bottom-up approach, top-down coming from law and uh, feminism, or and the bottom-up coming from history and feminism, or feminist legal studies, or feminist studies, or gender studies more modernly, but she uses, she continues to use the term feminist. Feminist legal scholars engage in politics of legal change and irrevocable and irreverably irre looks and ir invariably looks towards a different and brighter future. The feminist legal historian's enterprise is directed at the past. This demarcation allows for clear demarcation between the fields and allows for an appreciation for the feminist legal history's e efficacy. It lifts the veil of silence and cures the amnesia of historical record, so by focusing on both, and may influence feminist legal scholars directly and indirectly. It is here, in this hermeneutical, synthesis constituting the feminist legal historian's creative task, where the critical and po political gravity of the contribution of the histories of the, of the first theme is to be found. So the first lesson told of the past is that there has been no degree of continuity and consistency in the law's conduct towards women. Despite varying intensity, law continues to operate in ways that constrain, discriminate against, disadvantage, and disempower women. The continuum of impression, she calls it. Historing, historicizing law's conducts may add no major political or critical novelties to feminist legal scholarship's agenda, but it does serve to strengthen the modern diagnoses and arguments about the nature and power of law. So there is some power, but the power is debatable. But I believe by combining the two, law and history, it would be most um, effective. The second lesson is also the concerns about the nature of law, but it seeks to nuance the conclusions of the first. These types of history have sought to transmit past wisdom and experiences of attempts to feminize law and thereby enrich, embolden, or even warn against the current politics of legal reform.
and therefore it's a more usable, optimistic or usable past. So the the latter, the historiography, the feminist history is perhaps more positive or perhaps more useful, or maybe vice versa, but nonetheless both must be used. Therefore, enchantment with women's agency is not peculiar to feminist legal history, taking their first steps in the 1970s. Please note that's also the similar period as critical legal studies was um, in, uh, getting a lot of attention as well. Feminist historians espouse the self-same promise to engraft women as a subject of history and as history makers, posting women as subjects and active agents, and they defined feminist legal history's position as a sister field to feminist history. And it need a symbiosis, there therefore needs to be a symbiosis of the two fields. The latter is not inherently superior. And there's a paradox here in that the frag fragile identity between law and hist history. So there already was a, a fragile identity between law and history, but nonetheless they, they developed two completely different strands that have not been um, reconciled in particular geographies, namely the United Kingdom on the far end of the spectrum, and therefore control and non-control. And the intellectual dependency on sister fields need not be seen as walls, but opportunities. Therefore, feminist legal history hitherto has accounted for its situatedness as a field in institutional terms only, questions of positionality that engage the subject, position, and identity of the scholars, such as who speaks, how, why, from where, have largely been neglected. In reading these questions, feminist legal historians ask whether or how she can partake in the events of law's tradition and its process of transmission. In other words, what right and from what standpoint can she, with no obvious affiliation to the many generations of male makers, teachers, interpreters, custodians, and receivers of law's traditions, intervene in law, and from what and from her intervention should take? Therefore, there's a call for the excavation and recovery of the suppressed or lost female genealogies in law, as well as feminist textual traditions critical of law, make mediating past and present of the what feminization of the law may be but only i see i think she does she's not clearly advocating for the american approach over the, the english approach but there should be some some institutionalization or some syn greater synergies between law and feminism and feminism and history but perhaps not absolute institutionalization or as extreme as perhaps in the united states but nonetheless it should be on the spectrum and should use both so perhaps closer to the United States than in the United Kingdom, where she is a scholar. This otherwise feminist history, although continuing to remain faithful to interdisciplinarity, is able to clearly distinguish its own direction and historical research from that of its sister fields. So it's necessary that there is a distinguish. They are, uh, they are distinguished from each other. And it can thus adapt an intellectual borings to its own independent theoretical and methodological concerns, whilst the continuation of histories it narrates, offering of a new way of critically thinking critically about law. So once again, it's an extension of critical legal studies, sexual difference and belonging together with self-reflective practice of feminine legal history are both worth accomplishments, worthy accomplishments in their own right, and yet complementary to that which already exists. So that is a, a fantastic overview of feminist legal scholarships in the English-speaking world, but the spectrum within the English-speaking world, how it's developed, and where it should go. So once again, an exposition and proposition. So to discuss the chapter content before moving to the comparison with the previous two authors. So her institution is the University of Kent, Kent School of Law, Kent Law School. Her positions include Professor of Law and also the co-director of the Center for Critical Thought, or the CTT. Her suggested readings include Feminist Encounters with Legal Philosophy, where she was an editor, of the, published by the Rutledge Cavendish Press in 2013. Special Issue History, Space and Time, edited with Chrysotalis J, published by the Australian Feminist Law Journal in 2013 and the special issue Gender Equality and Othering of the Swedish Welfare State, edited with Davies M, published by Feminists at Law in 2013. Her research focus includes feminist and political theory, continental feminist philosophy, post-colonial theory, history and historiography, legal philosophy, and feminist jurisprudence. Once again, her chapter is titled 
It is in section three, Perspectives, Legal History and Modern Legal Thought in the Oxford Handbook of History, and it is chapter 32, Feminist Historiography of Law and Exposition and Proposition. Moving to the quotes, there are four of them that I've taken down. The individual studies deemed to belong to this new field shared neither a common ideology nor a common theoretical approach or methodology. They were united by the orientation of their legal historical inquiry, with its core focus directed at addressing Shanley's essential concerns, namely why, how, and in what ways does law in all its historical instantiations matter for women. Next quote. From the outset, feminist legal historians in the USA openly declared their alliance with the two major disciplinary developments that had taken place in the 1970s, those of critical legal history and women's history. So between the two fields, or a synergy, or no, amalgamation of the two. The concern of the situatedness of the field was not met with the same fervor on the other side of the Atlantic, in the English Academy, there was neither a clearly designated institutional space of enunciation nor a group of scholars openly claiming identity as feminist legal historians. So there was not quite this merger or institutionalization in England and the other end of the spectrum. Last quote, the otherwise feminist history, although continuing to remain faithful to interdisciplinarity, is able to clearly distinguish its own direction of historical research from that of its sister field. So the necessity of of demarcating where its boundaries are, even though it is an amalgamation of the two others, is important to have its um, to lead to its best manifestations. So, moving to the comparison in the style of Plutarch's lives. So, on, I know usually it's two, but sometimes there are three because Emilius Christio Dulaitis and Johann van der Welt co authored a chapter, so they've been put together. Um, and that of Maria Dracopoulou, who wrote her own chapter. So the differences, um, there, um, Christio Dulaitis was at the a professor at the University of Glasgow, Johann van der Waal is a professor at the University of Lu uh, Luxembourg, and Maria Dracopoulou is a professor at the University of Kent. So Christio Dulaitis and Dracopoulou are both currently professors in the United Kingdom, whereas van der Waal is currently in the European Union, because the United Kingdom is no longer part of the Euro European Union. A similarity between Emilius Christo, Christo Dulaitis and Johann van der Waal is that they're both, um, one is the docent of the University of Helsinki in, um, Finland, in, in Finland, and van der Waal is a uh, extraordinary professor at the University of Professor in South Africa. So this perhaps leads me to conclude that uh, Christo Dulaitis and van der Waal are from Helsinki and and uh, and South Africa, respectively. And Maria Dracopoulou, while not being a, uh, she is not she does not have a simultaneous professor appointment. She's a co-director of the Center of Critical Thought at the University of Kent. However, I believe, based on her last name and the fact that she practiced as a barrister for the Athens Bar is also is Greek. So they all come from quite quite different countries. Uh, Christo Dolitis could perhaps also be Greek too because it does also sound a bit Greek as well but I think he's Finnish but I'm not certain. But a uh, difference between Mar Maria Dracopoulou and Christo Dolitis and van der Waal is that Christo Dolitis and van der Waal do not at least on their biography pages list any um, experience practicing law whereas Maria Dracopoulou, before entering her career, was a barrister. A uh, barrister is, uh, unlike in the United States, there's a split bar also in Greece where there are barristers who do the court and the, much of the public speaking and such, and there are solicitors who do much of the writing and drafting of documents. Not that one is better than the other, they're just very different, whereas in the United States they're combined. However, many attorneys do only practice, as they're called in the United States, do only practice solicitor work, and many attorneys do only practice barrister or litigation work. They all have approximately three books. Um, some are uh, co-authors, such as um, Johann van der Waal is co-authors of all his books, whereas, um, whereas uh, Maria Dracopoulou and Christo Dolitis did write some of their own books or edit some of their own books by themselves. They're both, in terms of both of their, all of their scholarship, they're all on the left-leaning side, as where the critical legal studies is critical of the 
perhaps the oppressive state, so it is considered often on the left side, even though often the left wing does mean a larger government, it's critical of the uh, sort of a, a oppression that could be caused by the right wing. So it is generally considered on the left wing of the spectrum. However, however the way their chapter is written, it's very nuanced and perhaps very much in the center. Whereas feminist legal history is more clearly um, on the left leaning side, but it is an extension of critical legal studies. So from the left on the left. Uh, they are a difference in terms of their writing here. The Christo Dolitis and Van der Waal were co-authors of their chapters. Maria Dracopoulou wrote her chapter by herself. And um, I guess the, the main comparison is they're all fascinated in history. The styles of writing their chapters were a bit different, whereas Christo Dolitis and Van der Waals was a bit more thematic, sort of going through time, starting with the... Um, this separation of Rome uh, between the Roman kings and the and religious powers to Hegel to to, uh, to all to the your ENS your, um, in France all just it was more chronological whereas Maria Dracopoulou was um, perhaps more um, less chronological but still very descriptive and also another comparison between their two chapters is Christo Dolitis and Van der Waals covered exclusively critical legal studies in Europe, whereas Maria Dracopoulou studied feminist legal history in both particularly the United States and England, and by extension Canada and the United States, but both continents, both North America and I guess Australia as well, and Europe, but also specifically for the English-speaking world, whereas Christo Dolitis and Van der Waal did cover some content of the Italy and France and Germany as well and Russia as well so the little differences there so nonetheless I hope you learned a lot about these two very important areas of legal scholarship and uh, I guess may, the main conclusion also is they're both they're all fascinated in legal history which is not true of all lawyers but I hope you enjoyed this um, critical legal studies and feminist legal history are two of the most important and growing still growing fields in legal scholarship so I hope this was a good overview. I know there was a lot of content to cover, but I hope it might make sense if you perhaps watch some of the other videos, such as the Marxism video by um, where Christopher Tomlins, the editor of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, was the author, or perhaps the chapter by Chris, uh, by um, Marcus D. Dubber, which covers interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity and doctrinalism, which is particularly on the spectrum between common law and civil law. So once again, this is from the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. Thanks for, so much for watching or listening to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft, and hope you continue to support. Thank you so much.